I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. So there's an entire generation who has become numb and uh, unaffected and ignorant of the ways of God. Does this sound familiar at all? An entire generation of covenant people who are cut off from the ways of God. about being filled with the Spirit today, and this is a conversation of, about the topic. Um, it's not a how-to, even though I'll give some practicals at the end, but this is a conversation that we've been having for a long time, and it's just another conversation that's a little bit more pastoral and conversational. Uh, this isn't going to make it into a, this wouldn't be a chapter of a book, um, and so it's uh, from me to those sitting in this room um, as we develop culture and talk about this uh, most prominent thing in the scriptures. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, we, I invite you to accompany me as I speak. I ask for the gift of teaching now. I pray for um, the presence of the Lord to be in this space. I ask that the understanding of each person in the room would be open, that their hearts would be open. I pray that the busyness of our week and the cares of life that we have been um, somewhat consumed with this week would be uh, set down in just a real simple way, not only for this teaching, but for everything that's to follow from now through our next uh, sermon time to our worship time, to our ministry time. We make space for you now, not only space in our schedule from 10 to 1230, but we make space in our hearts. We make space in our minds. Uh, Lord, it's as if we are empty cups and we want to be filled. Filled with you, filled with your truth, filled with your power, filled with your presence. So help us now, Lord. Teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. Life in the Spirit is one of the primary themes of the New Testament. So you, you see these verbs, uh, like receiving the Spirit is a, a common phrase in the New Testament, topic in the New Testament. We typically understand that as uh, a thing that happens the moment we believe in Jesus. We immediately are indwelt. We receive His Spirit. Then there's this, another verb, uh, though all the other rest of them are water verbs. So you get baptized in the Spirit, right, which is this dunking, it's this immersing, this experience. Sometimes that happens at the same time you receive the Spirit. In a way, it does happen when you receive the Spirit. But there's also this, uh, a, a separate event uh, that we'll often term as being baptized with the Spirit, in which uh, the Holy Spirit just floods you in an unusual way, and it, it produces some sort of a breakthrough in your life. Uh, breakthrough in your heart. It's a beautiful, awesome, wonderful experience. Um, there's the phrase in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, I will pour out my spirit, again, using like a water analogy, uh, that the Holy Spirit is like water and we're like a cup and God or Jesus is, is pouring out the spirit in us. Just a helpful way for us to try to find language for this experience. Um, Then a very common phrase, to be filled with the Spirit, again, pulling on that same water analogy, as if we are empty and we can be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And then Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit as a river of living water flowing from heaven through us and out to other dry and thirsty people in our world, right? So a river of living water flowing from our heart. This water language was used to describe many of the spiritual experiences of the early Christians, and we still use them today. Um, The apostles of Jesus encountered believers who were not filled with the Spirit, and they helped get them filled. So a lot of the real fun Holy Spirit stories in the New Testament is the apostles meeting somebody and thinking, I don't know that you're filled with the Spirit. Can I help you? (laughs) Right? And so we see these wonderful interactions happening first, I guess, privately, where there's no other apostle around, just somebody in their living room getting filled. 
That happens sometimes in the New Testament. Uh, I think about, specifically think about Luke chapter number one, Zechariah by himself praying, Elizabeth by herself doing the dishes, John the Baptist kind of by himself hanging out in his mother's womb, just getting filled with the Spirit, right? Individually, privately, nobody else around, just God filling people with the Spirit. Um, Sometimes it happens one-to-one, like uh, Ananias traveling to Straight Street, to Judas' house, and finding a man named Saul, probably laying in the fetal position, saying, God, please make it stop. And Ananias says, "Uh, Brother Saul, I have been sent here to um, see that you are filled with the Spirit. And he laid hands on him, and Paul was super, Saul, Paul was supernaturally filled with the Spirit. That's kind of a one-to-one scenario that happens sometimes. Uh, sometimes it happens in small group settings uh, where people are filled with the Spirit experientially. Uh, think about in Cornelius' living room. Cornelius' family and extended family and cousins and nieces and aunts and all of them. And then uh, Peter and a couple of his uh, team members, and they all come together in Cornelius' living room, and there is a ex- experiential filling with the Holy Spirit. That's like in a small group. And sometimes it happens in a large group setting, um, like um, um, in a large prayer meeting in Acts chapter number four, or even in the upper room on the day of Pentecost with over a hundred people simultaneously getting filled with the Spirit. Privately, one-to-one, small group, large group. Some of the most exciting stories in the New Testament are people being filled with the Spirit, some the first time, and sometimes in a subsequent experience in their life. They'd been filled before, but it's exciting to see the story of them getting filled again. So this is, being filled with the Spirit, is a dominant theme in our ministry uh, of the Father's house, uh, both locally and nationally. Um, as As we have taught on being filled with the Spirit, and as we have aimed to see people get filled with the Spirit, we have found that a particular spirit of dissension um, can surround this topic. Uh, a, um, so when somebody has a heart of offense, a heart filled with offense, uh, and I think I have a, a slide of this. When, when, when somebody has a heart of offense, an invitation to discover more uh, can be retranslated into an accusation of lack. I'm offering you more. You're saying I'm missing something. No, no, I said more. You're saying I'm missing. No, wrong M word. I'm just saying the word more, and you keep hearing missing. Why? What's the disconnect here? How come when I say more, it retranslates in your mind and you hear missing? Why, are you, why is this an offensive thing? Well, it's because there's a heart of offense in the people that retranslate that. Not their own fault. They don't want the heart of offense. They don't even know they have the heart of offense. It's up to us to compassionately pastor them and understand I know why you're reacting that way. And now, Holy Spirit, how can I help them overcome this heart of offense, right? Jesus encountered this as well. John chapter number 8. Jesus uh, comes to those who believed in him, many who believed in him, and he said this. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What a simple statement. What a wonderful statement from Jesus. He said the truth that I have for you is going to set you free. And immediately, what did they hear? We've never been a slave to anybody. I didn't say you were, I'm saying there's a freedom for you that if you embrace my truth, you'll experience a greater freedom in your life. You call me a slave? Boy, right? Okay. Uh, So he says, well, if you want to go there, uh, you're a slave to sin. And then the whole thing just went kind of down from there. Um, It got hostile. They tried to kill him at the end, all right? Um, but it's, a, it's something that Jesus encountered, it's something that we encounter, and we can encounter it through many conversations, but fullness of the Spirit is a particular one it, it, that triggers that heart of offense in some portion of the body where we say more and they hear missing, right? So uh, we kind of have resolved as a f- church family that we will continue as long as the Lord gives us an audience to do so, both here and abroad, to facilitate conversations around this topic, because it's a conversation that needs to be had. Uh, We will share our personal testimonies to all who will listen. We will demystify the experience of being filled with the Spirit for those who are curious yet cautious. There's a lot of people who want to know more, but they're a little cautious. Let's demystify it, and let's connect it to maybe an experience you've already had, or an experience that's right there in the Scriptures. 
or an experience that a guy from 150 years ago, who apparently you trust, because like you know him, 150 years ago, that's trustworthy? Okay, let me show you what a guy 150 years ago said. You see? So it's not some new agey thing. This is biblical. Pastor Ken says it so much better. Um, demonstrate, we, we've, we've committed to demonstrate what spirit fullness looks like up close and personal. We invite people to come close and say, come into those doors, come into our living room, come into our prayer meetings, and see what spirit fullness looks like. Um, we want to make people hungry for more of Jesus and his spirit, and then we want to create spaces for breakthrough and outpouring moments to occur. So one of the dominant themes of the New Testament, being filled with the Spirit and how to live a life in the Spirit, becomes one of the dominant themes in our house, in our community, um, for what we believe the Lord is calling us to do in a generation. Every generation needs to be awakened to the things that the first generation needed to be awakened to. Every generation starts anew. And so the Lord raises up people to bring biblical themes to the forefront. Uh, We have often said, that when the gifts of the Spirit are present in a church, everyone gets to play. And if you remember a verse like this years ago, Pastor Ken, when he first started talk, talking about the gifts, he, he, would, he anchored us in this concept that w- with the gifts of the Spirit present in the church, everyone gets to play because everyone has a gift. And a great illustration of the diversity of a body of Christ all operating in gifts is in 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Well, my brothers and sisters, let's summarize. So Paul says, let's talk about what church should look like. Um, When you meet together, one will sing, another will teach, another will tell some special revelation God has given, one will speak in tongues, and another will interpret what is said. So there's some diversity there. There's a lot of people involved, and that's a lot of communication that is from the Lord to the body. So in order for us to be able to have a a first century type church where the gifts are present and where many different people are operating in gifts, We need a bunch of people hearing from God and being God's mouthpiece. In other words, we need a church filled with spirit-filled people. People who are spirit-filled on Saturday in preparation for Sunday. Not people who just come empty on Sunday morning, ready to get filled up and then only to leave again. In order to have a church operating like this, we need to have people filled with the Spirit through the week. We need a lifestyle of being full of the Spirit That way, they can be proclaiming spirit-prompted speech. So if you do a study in the New Testament, um, you'll find this pattern. Nearly every time the phrase filled with the Spirit appears in the New Testament, it's describing a person or a group of people who were empowered by the Spirit in such a way where their words became supernaturally guided by God. That's a really lengthy definition or or outcome of spiritfulness. Spiritfulness is when I am connected with the Spirit or empowered with the Spirit in such a way where my speech becomes guided by God and it bears fruit by edifying the people and really blessing the people. And so that speech could be a sermon, that speech could be a song, that speech could be a revelation that I share, that speech could be a word of encouragement, that speech could be just the right verse spoken to your heart at just the right time, that speech could be me praying, just a prayer publicly given that is definitely guided by God and bears fruit in the body, that speech could be a message in tongues that somebody stands up and delivers to the whole church, they deliver it to God because tongues is almost always a message to God, so I'm going to stand up here and I'm going to deliver a a, 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 maybe a statement or several sentences in tongues knowing that there is an interpreter in the room who is also being given some revelation from the Lord of, I think I know, I know what he's communicating. I don't know what he's saying because it's in tongues, but I know the essence of the message that he's communicating. The Lord has given me a, a revelation. He's given me an interpretation. And so I'm going to come up and I'm going to share it, right? All of these different ways that spirit-prompted speech can outcome, all of it is dependent. None of it can come from the flesh. All of it is dependent on me being connected with Holy Spirit and empowered by Holy Spirit in such a way where he's able to speak in and through me, right? So if we want a church that practices these sorts of gifts, we need a church that really understands the ways of the Spirit and understands fullness of Spirit on a real personal level. In each of those references to being filled with the Spirit in the Bible, we find a couple of things. 
Number one, being filled with the Spirit individually, personally, being filled with the Spirit, it is experiential. It's not something you just have to believe that happened. I, just, I, can't, I can't sense anything. I don't feel anything. <laughs> uh, there's no evidence. I'll just believe by faith that I'm filled. That's fine if you want to do that, but that's not what fullness of the Spirit looks like in the Scriptures. And that's not what the fullness of the Spirit looks like in, in our estimation either or, or in our experience. It is experiential. You know it and others know it. Right? You know it and others know it around you. Sometimes it is sudden or unexpected or suddenly filled with the Spirit. That happens sometimes, and that's exciting, right? And then it can also be enjoyed often, which is another thing we find from the New Testament, that it's not only up to the whim of God on whether or not he feels like you're ready to be filled. Hmm, Rusty hasn't been filled in a couple months. Maybe I'll fill him. Like, it's up to just the whim of God. There is an aspect of that. There is an aspect that Jesus is the one that baptizes, and Jesus is the one that fills people with his spirit, and sometimes he sees, Rusty needs a breakthrough. And so I'm going to give Rusty a breakthrough. I'm going to fill him with the Spirit in a real special way. And it's, gonna, it's just going to burst a dam that is in the river, maybe. It's just going to blow it up. And uh, he's going he's gonna to experience a special flowing. Sometimes the Lord does that because he sees that we need it. But it's not only that. Fullness of the Spirit is also a lifestyle. And it's also, it can become reputational. This is one of those words that I had to Google like Pastor Ken sometimes. He makes up words and puts them on slides and then verifies that they're real. This is one of those words. It's reputational. It is a real word. Uh, meaning that we can have a reputation for being filled with the Spirit. After all, this is the age of spirit fullness, is it not? This is the age. This is the Spirit-filled age, and we are lucky enough and blessed enough to live in the age of the outpoured Spirit, to live in the age of spirit fullness. This is our age. This is our time. Uh, Joel looked forward to these days that we're living in right now. He said, after doing all those things, I, Yahweh says, will pour out my spirit upon all people, even in the 21st century, even in 2022. Your sons and your daughters, that's us, will prophesy. Why will we be able to prophesy? Because the spirit's going to be poured out. We're going to live in the age of spirit fullness. Your old man will dream dreams. Your young man will see visions. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on servants, men and women alike. We live in that age. We should be able to expect that the outpouring of the Spirit, fullness of the Spirit, should become a lifestyle, should become something we regularly experience, not once in every 10 years like in the Old Testament. We don't live under that covenant. Reputational I get from um, Acts chapter number 6. So we have the 12. Judas is gone. Matthias has taken his place. The new 12. And they are ruling over the church. They're leading the church. And then there's this dispute with the Grecian widows. Acts chapter number 6. Our widows are being neglected. All right. Choose seven men who you know have a reputation of being filled with the Spirit. So we know that that can't be a whim then. It can't be just something that God does occasionally, sometimes, to just thrill our hearts. It has to be something that can become a lifestyle. Otherwise, the, the, uh, the people wouldn't have said, okay, guys, let's make a short list. Where's that whiteboard? Let's make a, uh, let's make a list on the whiteboard. Let's, who are all the men in our, in our community who live filled with the Spirit? Let's make a list. Let's pray over the list. These seven are the ones that we'll choose. Reputational. Something that can become a lifestyle. This concept of being filled with or full of is something that's common in the New Testament. It's not just about being filled with or full of the Holy Spirit. So if you search for this phrase, filled with, in all the evidences or in all the usages in the Old and New Testament, and you search for full of, you find that this is a really common language used for good things and used for bad things. So I found 21 good ones and 21 bad ones. Maybe there's more, but I stopped at 21 and 21 because I thought it was just perfect. And I wanted to rival Dan Bill Heisler. All right, so uh, from the positive, here's the positive things that people are filled with in the, New Test or in the Old and New Testament. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of skill, the spirit of the Lord. The Holy Spirit, understanding, comfort, filled with all the fullness of God, filled with the knowledge of his will, filled with the fruit of righteousness, filled with strength, filled with justice, filled with might, filled with awe, filled with glory, filled with joy, filled with light. Filled with gladness, filled with faith, 
filled with grace, power, goodness, and knowledge. All different usages in which biblical writers say this person is filled with this thing. And then on the negative side, there's a lot of negative things that humans are filled with in the Bible. Fear, adultery, filled with fury, filled with disgrace, filled with jealousy, filled with all manner of unrighteousness, filled with evil, covetousness, malice, envy, murder, filled with strife, deceit, maliciousness, confusion, sorrow, guilt, lies, hypocrisy, wrath, and troubles. So filled is not just Holy Spirit language. It's a whole concept of understanding mankind, understanding how our, our inner man is comprised, understanding how our emotions have such a way to fill like our whole space so that we're dominated by this thing that this emotion has produced and it's affecting everybody we look at and every word we say and everything we hear because we're filled with this thing, either in the positive or the negative, right? So what does it mean to be filled with something in the Scriptures? Um, well, it means that your actions are being influenced by that thing. If I'm filled with fear, it means everything that I do is tainted with this underlying fear that I'm filled with. It's affecting everything. Um, or you're controlled by something, controlled by the Holy Spirit, controlled by envy. Or that you are overtaken with something. I'm overtaken with joy, right? In this moment, I'm just overtaken with joy. It's just bubbling out of me, and I'm laughing, and I'm smiling, and it's this joy unspeakable and full of glory, like Peter said. I can be filled with joy, right? Your actions are being influenced by a thing, you're controlled by a thing, or you are overtaken by something. This is what it means to be filled. And you can't be filled with one of those negative things that I just talked about and simultaneously be filled with the Spirit, can you? Those of us who understand what being filled with the Spirit is like and what kind of a lifestyle this is, we know that in the moment that I'm filled with rage or dissension or strife, I am not simultaneously filled with the Spirit in a way that I feel empowered and ready to give spirit-prompted speech. I'm just not. I'm not ready for that. Right? Sometimes, throughout the week, I'll get filled in a momentary way, filled with anger, filled with offense, filled with frustration. And if you paused my life right then, I would not be ready to lead a prayer meeting. I would not be ready to, uh, to prophesy to someone because I'm in such a way where I'm filled with something even momentarily. And so to, in order to be filled with the Spirit on a regular basis, I need to recognize, oh, I'm filled with something right now other than the Holy Spirit and the fruits that He produces. So now how do I get out of this? Because I want to, be, I want to live filled with the Spirit, and I want to be ready to minister at any time. I want to be like Jesus. So this doesn't feel like Jesus. So understanding our own selves and understanding the ways in the Lord, of the Lord in such a way where I can live a Spirit-filled life. Some of that language that uh, some of that language here is is uh, in Romans chapter number eight. I guess I'll just read it. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature, almost twenty one bad things, dominated. Notice the language: dominated by a sinful nature. Uh, think about sinful things. That's about right. When I'm filled with rage. I'm thinking about sinful things. But those who are controlled by Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. And when I'm thinking about things that please the Spirit, I'm in harmony with the Lord, and I'm ready to minister. I'm ready to worship the Lord uh, with, with joy and with love that He deserves. Romans 8, uh, that's verse number 5. So we must learn the ways of the Spirit of God and learn the individual ways the Spirit moves in and through us. And that's the purpose of this and what we'll talk about for the last few minutes. Learning the ways of the Spirit. Uh, this language comes to us from Exodus 33. This is so important. So important. So Yahweh, up on Mount Zion, invited the whole nation to come close, to come up, and to learn his ways, and to know him on a personal, individual basis. And what did they say? Exodus 19. Nah, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, Moses, you go up. We don't want to get that close. So Moses does go up, and he asks this. He says, now therefore... If I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Show me now your ways. I want to know your ways, Lord. I just don't want your laws. 
don't want you to dictate things to me and me become a robot, a servant, just constantly in a state of you say it, I obey it, you say it, I obey it, right? No, I want to know your ways. I want to know why you say things. I want to know how you say things. I want to know from what part of your heart is this statement coming from. I want to know your ways. I want to be in the yoke with you, Jesus, where you're in the yoke and I'm in the yoke right next to you. And as you go this way, I say, okay, Jesus, why are we going that way? And you can tell me, right? And now we want to go this way. Why are we going that way? Oh, because you know, fix your eyes on that. Oh, I see, right? I'm learning his ways. Moses sought to know the Lord's ways, and this is one reason why he was used in such a way. Hebrews 3.10, the Holy Spirit says, this is the Holy Spirit now speaking on that passage we were just talking about in Exodus 33, the Mount Sinai Moses thing. The Holy Spirit says, I was provoked with that generation. They provoked the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit that they were ignoring. I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. So there's an entire generation who has become numb and uh, unaffected and ignorant of the ways of God. Does this sound familiar at all? An entire generation of covenant people who are cut off from the ways of God. Moses was the, was the one alone. In David's days, they sought to restore this. The whole covenant community, because of the tabernacle of David and the culture of heaven that David brought to the earth with the tent of the tabernacle of David, because of that worship culture, they, they all were so fascinated with the Lord that an entire generation, again, David's generation, sought to understand and know the ways of the Lord. So you see that evidenced here in Psalms 25. Make me to know your ways, O Yahweh. Like the generation in the wilderness didn't want to know, like Moses alone wanted to know, now let us know your ways. Teach us your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I will wait and wait and wait until you show me your ways, until I am one with you, until I'm connected and in harmony with the Lord in such a way where I learn his ways. I learn what he likes and what he doesn't like um, because he tells me as a friend, because I commune with the Lord as friend with friend. Show me your ways. We want to know the ways of the Spirit, right? We don't want to just be able to rattle off every usage of being filled with the Spirit and say, so daggone it, you aren't right with God if you're not filled with the Spirit. Okay, no. We want, we want to understand personally the ways of the Spirit so that we can flow in Him, so that we can stand in that river and flow on a regular basis. So here's some things to avoid. Uh, this isn't taken from a book, and this isn't uh, taken from, you know, these six prominent passages about things to avoid. This is just personal experience and advice on, uh, on living in Spirit. So some things to uh, avoid, some things that grieve the Spirit, grieve and quench. I have found that harboring offense and unforgiveness is one of the quickest ways to grieve and quench the spirit so that I feel cut off from him and I am not in a place where I'm ready to minister. I'm not in a place where, um, where I could say, I'm filled. I'm connected with the Lord right now. My mind is connected with his mind and I'm ready to, ready to serve. Harboring offense and unforgiveness. That can be offense towards Candace. It can be offense towards my boys. That can be offense towards my brother elders. Sometimes I'm offended by them. Um, that can be offense, huh? You said really? Sometimes I can be offended by my family, my friends, um, my boss, my coworkers. Sometimes I'm offended. And as long as I hold on to that offense, I'm not, my ears are, are basically closed to the flow of Holy Spirit communication that I rely on for prophecy and words of knowledge and things. I have to get rid of offense. It's just like this massive wall. It just gets built up. Unforgiveness is another one. Um, yeah. Next. Uh, hiding sin. You know where you sin, and then you, you just choose to forget about it. We're just going to forget about that one, Lord. It's like, no, you don't, we don't forget about it. You need to confess and repent and let Jesus get down and wash your feet. Right? And as long as I'm harboring some, hi, uh, some, some hidden sin, um, it's, uh, it's, it's something between me and the Lord, and it can be a, a boulder in the river that keeps the river from flowing. Um, pride is another one. I have a problem with pride. I'm Jared, and I have a problem with pride. There you go. I said it. Uh, next one, distraction and busyness. It's a big one for me, distraction, social media the garbage reel portion of Facebook and YouTube. <laughs> that stuff's for the trash. Oh, my goodness. 
Uh, wow. Talk about so the, uh, TikTok. I, I downloaded it. I'm not, I'm not against any of you all for having TikTok. I downloaded it for like a day. And uh, all of a sudden, I found myself looking at it. And like two hours went by, and I said, oh, my goodness, what happened to my life? Did I just enter into some sort of a vortex and delete this app? This is going to be the death of me. Um, but distraction and busyness, right? I want to live full of the Spirit. I want to be ready to minister and prophesy and love and pray for people at any time. I need to be careful about distraction and busyness, right? Um, and disobedience, just flat-out disobedience, the thing that three Ds, three Ds get you swapped in my, in my house growing up, right? Disobedience, disrespect, and disobedience. It's one of the, uh, uh, dishonesty, disrespect, and disobedience. There we go. Uh, one of the big Ds in, in the long household, um, but it's one of the big Ds in the life of dad too, right? Just disobedience. The Lord tells me to do something, and I don't do it, and I have a great excuse, and I can rationalize it away really simply, right? It's disobedience, and I have to repent of that. Now, I say all this, but you know what? The Lord can fill me with the Spirit with any of those things still present. You look at the church that was obviously filled with the Spirit and all the gifts of the Spirit was Corinth, right? And did they have all that worked out? No, and yet they were flowing in the Spirit. So this isn't, this isn't a list of laws that, oh, if you don't do these things, you'll never be filled with the Spirit. It's not that. It's just an experience from me of striving or trying or attempting to live a life in the Spirit and to live in a way where Monday through Sunday, I can prophesy. Monday through Sunday, I can lay hands on people and pray. Monday through Sunday, I can feel that prompting from the Lord to go do ministry, no matter where I am, at the gas station, at Home Depot, at work, or at home. And as I strive to live in that place, I find that these five become a big hindrance to that when I quench and grieve the Spirit. So I'm constantly watching out for these things. Keep them in check. And then the things, that, the things to do. We'll end with this. Things that lead to fullness. Things that we need to add to the rhythm of our life if we want to live a spirit-filled life. Of course, number one, what's it going to be? Read the scripture, right? Reading the scripture. It's obvious, but let us never go past it. Reading the God-breathed words, the living book, the miracle book. His words are spirit and they are life. And when we read those, we connect our mind with, to his mind in such a unique way where we understand how he thinks his words flow through our mind and into our heart. And what did the Bible say? The Bible says that in the age of the new covenant, when his law is etched on our heart, how is his law etched on our heart? When we read, the Holy Spirit accompanies our reading. When we read in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit accompanies our reading, and he etches things in our heart so that we remember them, so that they mark us, so that they change us from the inside out. Reading Scripture. Number two. Uh, praise and worship. Come on. Praise and worship. To join in to the culture of heaven. That's what praise and worship is. The culture of heaven reproduced in your living room, in your car, in this house, wherever you are, when you are praising and worshiping in the Spirit, you are recreating the culture of heaven on the earth. We are bringing heaven to earth. We're bringing the atmosphere, the fragrance that exists in heaven, the fragrance of praise and worship, this incense that just is offered up to the Lord, this sacrifice of thanksgiving and of praise, like it says in Hebrews. We are offering a sacrifice to the Lord, right? And the culture and atmosphere of heaven is reproduced in our own homes and in our own space. You don't have to do that for very long until you are in harmony with those in heaven with the citizens of heaven and with Jesus himself, and you are ready and, and putting yourself in a real great position to be filled and filled and filled and on the same page and with him. Uh, listening to music. Listening to music is huge. So there's a really cool story about Elisha and listening to music and being filled with the Spirit. So let's look at that one. All right, 2 Kings 3. Jehoshaphat said, Is there no prophet of Yahweh here through whom we may inquire of Yahweh, of the Lord? He's asking his counsel. Jehoshaphat the king is asking his men, Where's the prophets of Yahweh who we can ask a question to? Then one of the king of, the king of Israel's servants answered, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here, who poured water on the hand of Elijah. He gives a little bit more explanation. The king says, Go get Elisha. 
Because we need a word from the Lord right now. We need a word from Yahweh. So go get that guy. When Elisha sees the servant come, he's not in a good space. He's not in a good mood. He's got a heart of offense that he has to deal with. Elisha said, as the Lord of hosts lives, it's like he's sitting in like a restaurant, you know? And he's like sitting at the bar and like these guys come in. And he just responds back as soon as he sees them come in. As the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand, meaning I'm a prophet who stands before the Lord. The way in which he's saying that, he means like in private, when I commune with Yahweh, I stand before him in the spirit. When I'm standing in my living room in the spirit, I'm gaining an audience at the throne room of Yahweh, which is a privilege that now is afforded to every one of us. Every one of us are priests like Elisha that get to stand before the Lord. But it was not common in Elisha's day for Elisha to be able to stand and have the confidence that while I stand on the earth, I have a presence before the throne. That was unusual, and it made him a special prophet. I, before whom I stand, were it not that I have regard for Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would neither look at you nor see you. Okay, bring me a musician. All right. <laughs> So he, 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 uh, he yells at these guys. He basically says, you know what? I can't even believe you're standing in here. I can't even believe you're coming to me right now after all the sins that you have not repented of, after all the messages, after all the, uh, the idols that you've worshipped, after all the groves and the high places that you've set up in offense against Yahweh, and now you want a word from Yahweh? I'd cast you out, except the king sent you, and I've got to respect the king. Okay, bring me a harpist. He brings him a harpist. Bring me a musician. And when the musician played, now I don't know how long the musician played, but Elisha knew, in this state, I'm not ready to prophesy right now. Bring me a musician. All right, play musician. I'm sure he was quiet. Maybe he began to pray. Maybe he began to sing. He's connecting with the Lord. This is what the Lord is saying. I will make this dry stream bed full of pools, and he keeps on going. The, the wisdom of Elisha, knowing the ways of the Spirit, knowing his own heart and what state he's in, knowing how to be Spirit-filled so that he can prophesy, he makes space and says, I'm not ready to prophesy right now. I'm very mad at you, um, but I can get there. You can listen to some music for a few minutes. Listening to music, so effective. We all know this, but just a great uh, biblical story that's a reminder. Next, uh, singing music privately and corporately. Singing music in your heart by yourself, and then singing corporately with your brothers and sisters. This is what Paul told us uh, that we need to focus on if we want to be filled with spirit. He said, don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Thank you, NLT, for making it so clear. Instead... Be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns. These are songs that are clearly written, songs from your hymn book, and spiritual songs. That's not a song from your hymn book. That's a song in the Spirit. That's singing in the Spirit. That's a song that you probably don't know even as you begin to sing it. But the Holy Spirit leads you and you begin to sing a song that you hadn't planned, a spontaneous song to the Lord. That's a spiritual song. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 14. Where sometimes we sing with our mind, that's to sing a song where I know the words and I can look at the words and with my mind, I sing the song. Like we do every Sunday when we look at the TV screens. And sometimes I sing a spiritual song. That's where my inner man bypasses my mind and the song comes from here to here. The song doesn't come from here to here. That's a mind song. I will sing with my mind, 1 Corinthians 14, but I'll also sing with my spirit. So it doesn't have to process through my mind. I don't need to even know what I'm saying. Sometimes I can sing in tongues. I, or it doesn't have to be tongues. I can sing in, in a, a spontaneous song that I'm not planning. So to put some music on, and uh, even if it's a song that you know, during the bridge, just begin to just allow the Holy Spirit to lead you to sing a song. Or you put some soaking music on, and you just start to say a verse, and you kind of put it to a melody, and then you just start to sing it to the Lord. And I'm not thinking about it. I'm just doing it. It's my spirit bypassing my mind, and just offering pure praise and worship to the Lord. It's beautiful. Spiritual songs among yourselves 
and making music to the Lord in your hearts. Making music to the Lord in your own heart, like even privately. Next. Um, so therefore, so singing music privately and corporately, music that we know, and then also singing in the Spirit, singing in tongues. Uh, Paul also talks about praying in spirit, praying in tongues in 1 Corinthians 14. Praying in the spirit is a unique gift because it edifies you personally more than it edifies everybody around you. In fact, it doesn't edify anybody around you unless they are, unless there's an interpreter and then it can edify them. Um, but praying in the spirit, praying in tongues. If you um, desire to be filled with the spirit and you already do pray in tongues, well, then just putting some music on, uh, some, maybe some soaking music, or even in the silence of your own room, and just saying, Lord, uh, I feel a spirit of strife in me right now. I want to be filled with the Spirit. And so, Lord, I repent of my anger. I ask for forgiveness. Maybe I need to get up right now and ask my wife or my son or my friend or my pastor or my boss for forgiveness as well. Okay. Uh, now, Lord, fill me with your Spirit. Let me, let me pray in the Spirit now. Fill me with your spirit and spend some time praying in the spirit, connecting in such a way where the river is flowing, where you can sense it, where you can feel it, and where you know, okay, um, I'm ready to minister if, in, if, it, it, um, if the Lord would desire me to minister today. Uh, I'm ready because I'm connected to him. Uh, asking to be filled, of course, is important. Asking to be filled. You can ask for this. Uh, look at the verses. Paul says a regular prayer of his is that he prays that his people will be filled with the Spirit of God, filled with all the fullness of God. That's just another way of saying with the Holy Spirit. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's a snippet from a prayer. So we know that we can pray, Lord, fill me. Fill me, Lord. And how many worship songs in this day and age around the world have this language of, Lord, fill us up, God. Fill us up, God. Fill us up, God. You wonder why the Holy Spirit has moved around the world like a fire? You wonder why the Holy Spirit has brought up a, a crop, a harvest in China and in South Korea and in India and even now in Pakistan and all throughout the continent of Africa and here in America and in South America and in Brazil. You wonder why the Holy Spirit is moving in such a way. Look at the worship songs. Look at the prayers of the church. Fill us up, God. We, we, we don't want to just believe by faith that something has happened. We want to know it. And, 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 yeah, searching for an experience, there can be a potential negative for that, but it's one of the greatest positives of the charismatic movement. Um, Ari Tori, and I'm almost done here. Two minutes, I'll be done. Ari Tori. Uh, whenever, whenever Ari Tori, 100 years ago, he was D.L. Moody's Holy Spirit guy. Whenever he um, taught on being filled with the Spirit, he always went to 1 John 5, 14 and 15. He said, this is the greatest prayer to pray if you want to be filled with the Spirit. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, being filled with the Spirit is according to his will. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We know he hears those prayers. Fill me, Lord, he hears that. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. And uh, he would hammer that one down as a wonderful one. And then Pastor Ken's done some great uh, work just privately, and I don't know how much of it he shared publicly, but in kind of thinking through Luke 11 and when it was written and to whom it was written and understanding that this teaching of Jesus was for believers and gives us the invitation to ask even now for more of the Holy Spirit. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Just ask. Ask to be filled on a regular basis. Um, and then engage Jesus with your sanctified imagination. Engage Jesus with your sanctified imagination. Um, uh, the Lord has given us this wonderful gift of our imagination, which we know as a church. And so to use that for spirit fullness is very effective. I'd love to go in 1 Chronicles 16 and, and show some of that to you. I, will stop, I won't for now. But here's just a short list of things that, uh, places that I go to in my sanctified imagination that uniquely connect me to the Lord and prepare me for spirit-filled ministry, which bring me into a place of, 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 of prophetic utterance, but going to the cross and just spending some time at the cross in my imagination, uh, going to a particular story in the Gospels, like walking on the water or any of the stories, um, going to the return of Jesus, 
Uh, going to the throne room. How many, how many times have I gone to the throne room in my sanctified imagination and been filled with the Spirit? Um, going to my own salvation experience and spending time there remembering. Significant moments in my past that I can visit through my imagination. The Lord can meet me there. Um, times the Lord has spoken to me. I can, I can revisit the times when the Lord has spoken very specific messages to my heart. And I can just soak in those words and in those moments and all kinds of great fruit is produced. Um, I go to the day when I meet Jesus face to face. I've played through that day 10,000 times of what it's going to be like when I walk up to him. I'm going to hug him before I fall at his feet. I'm confident of it. Um, we meet him face to face. And then um, visions that, you, that you've received. These are encounter moments that you can go back to. All of these things facilitate the spirit-filled life. Lord Jesus, fill us with your spirit. Teach us your ways that we might live lives filled with the spirit. Amen.